three, two, one, action. Action. I am acting. W what are you? I'm pretending to be petrified by a basilisk. It's the basilisk intro. Mm-hmm. Let's people know what the show's going to be about. Yeah, I figured if, if I was just still, then, then people would eventually figure it out that we're talking about basilisks. Okay, cut. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about basilisks on WebDM. <laughs> Train of stone. This episode is brought to you by Monty Cook Games, our boon companions and creators of many fine role playing games. They've written a cipher system book to go along with the colorful and imaginative board game Title Blades 2. Play humans, crocs, turtle folk, and other sea creatures in the paradise world of Naviri, and defend it from the sea monsters from beyond the fold. Backers get a free XP deck. The Title Blades 2 Kickstarter ends on Friday, April 8th, so check it out now. If that weren't all, MCG also wrote First Responders, an RPG like no other. Play as first responders dealing with real-world crises and disasters. We're talking using your character's special skills, capabilities, gear, and training to deal with volcanoes, earthquakes, pandemics, skyscraper fires, nuclear meltdowns, dam breaches, and even supernatural disasters from when your campaign takes that special turn to the paranormal. In First Responders, you're saving lives and dealing with hazards posed by disasters of all kinds, not fighting monsters or looting tombs. But speaking of which, because this is a Cypher System book, you can also use these rules for mega disasters in any Cypher System campaign, not just one set in the real world. You can get this game right now. Just head on over to the MCG shop and order your copy. Speaking of which, you can use the coupon code WebDMFANS at checkout on the MCG shop and get $5 off your order. Print, PDF, everything. Links in the comments and description. Hey everybody, welcome uh, to WebDM. I am Jim Davis and today we're talking about basilisks. One of my favorite monsters uh, from D&D simply because it is a simple creature, a reptilian monstrosity that can turn you to stone with but a glance, uh, an endlessly reskinnable and modifiable creature that has deep roots within legends and mythology that I find particularly inspiring, right? The basilisk is the king serpent, you know, this killer lizard chicken thing that when you read between the lines looks a lot like a cobra, sounds a lot like a cobra, but it's a creature that was described like thousands of years ago in ancient history and then has been repeated in permutations and variations throughout the centuries, taking on associations with alchemy and, and other kinds of uh, sort of pseudoscientific pursuits. It's a symbol for royalty and the like. And it's such a interesting monster simply because it's a snake that if you look at it, you die. <laughs> <laughs> everything around it dies, all the vegetation, all of the uh, other wildlife and the like. It leaves a trail of venomous slime and has a poisonous, noxious aura of miasma or whatever that uh, is inimical to all life. And it really is a creature that I find is endlessly uh, rewarding to use and really, really resonates uh, with players as they try to battle this creature that could leave half the party turned to some sort of very heavy uh, and cumbersome material. The Basilisk is one of those creatures that uh, comes to D&D through medieval bestiaries and uh, so-called <clears throat> natural histories of the ancient world in which uh, various scholars and authors try to describe a serpent-like or reptilian creature that can kill people just by staring at it and that vegetation dies wherever it goes and it, it you know, has this potent venom that it leaves a, a trail of uh, wherever it slithers. It's said to, uh, unlike regular serpents, be able to uh, stand upright and uh, slither about uh, that way. And so it's this just confusing sort of, are they talking about 
cobras or some other sort of uh, real world serpent? Are they mixing it up with uh, other legends and, and folklore and the like? Um, we're not really sure, but it, it uh, there's definitely a theme that exists for the basilisk every time it's mentioned of it is able to kill with a look or you look at it and, uh, and it kills. And so that's how we get it in D&D. Somehow it becomes stone, which it's always been stone uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. And so um, I guess that petrification is a stand in for uh, the, uh, the kinds of deadly effects that uh, the legends say the basilisk was able to uh, produce. One of the things that I find interesting about the basilisk is that it's this amalgam of other creatures and it's, you know, it's said to hatch when a rooster sits on an old egg that's from a lizard or a snake. Sometimes it's flipped and it's a, a lizard hatching a, uh, a chicken egg uh, or something like that. There's obviously a lot of overlap between the basilisks and uh, cockatrice. And in, in many legends, these are essentially, you know, two names for the same type of creature, but we're going to talk about the flying chicken lizard thing uh, some other time, and now we're talking about the lizard chicken thing that uh, <laughs> is uh, is the basilisk. And so, one of the key things is this: its deadliness, right? Just wherever it lives, it kills vegetation. Other animals are driven away. Um, only mongoose and other weasels are are said to be able to uh, kill it, and and then just by their stench alone can they kill a uh, basilisk. So there's a lot of just interesting stuff about this mythological creature. But then we take it one step further and we start reading or hearing about uh, alchemical texts in the Renaissance that mention basilisk blood or basilisk organs and the like being used in the transmutation of base metals into gold. And that's when we have the association uh, with um, alchemy and all the other symbolism that that entails. Uh, we can also draw on for our uh, Dungeons and Dragons games. Um, if you like what we do and uh, want to support us, you can go over and check us out over on Patreon. We have over 230 something podcasts uh, where we talk about all manner of tabletop RPG topics and hang out and have a real good time. So why don't you go over and check us out over on uh, Patreon, support us that way. One of my favorite myths about the uh, the basilisk, one of the stories about them, is it's said that its poison is so potent that someone riding on a horse that kills one with a spear, themselves and their horse will die because the venom travels up the spear and it comes anything that is in contact with it uh, is envenomed by this uh, very potent and powerful uh, creature. So I, th I think that leaves the door open for us as DMs to think of all different sorts of basilisks. What's, what types are there? Uh, how can they be portrayed in the game? And what are some interesting ways that we can shake up the basilisk uh, to present this rather standard monster to our players at fresh light? The standard 5e basilisk is, you know, a reptilian monstrosity. It's said to petrify victims, turning them into porous stone, and then it breaks off a chunk of it and eats it and it somehow turns back into flesh uh, during that process. And the stat block for it is pretty straightforward, you know. Uh, what I like about it though is that number one, uh, it can be petrified by its own gaze. I think that's really cool and opens up the door for players to use mirrors and other reflective services against uh, Basilisk. But there's other things that are mentioned in the descriptive text for the Basilisk that I think are interesting and worth exploring. One of them is that uh, basilisk eggs that are raised from captivity, uh, you know, basilisk can be domesticated, used as pets, even trained not to uh, look at their owners or owners that they deem are, are sort of, uh, you know, friends of the pet uh, so that they don't accidentally uh, petrify their, uh, their owners. I think that's really cool. Like I've used uh, basilisks as uh, Grimlock pets before, guarding various entrances and the like. Grimlock's of course blind and not able to uh, meet the gaze of a basilisk. Um, I've had basilisks uh, with gargoyles before. So gargoyles are immune to petrification. It doesn't matter if the basilisk looks at them. They can gaze into each other's eyes longingly without needing to worry about any harm. And the fact that like the flavor text is there suggests that all you gotta do 
is get some of these eggs, domesticate them, raise them uh, from birth. And, and like, you don't even need to be immune to petrification or, <laughs> uh, or have blind sight uh, in order to keep one of these pets. And so now I'm thinking that like, deep gnomes, dwarves, <laughs> darrow, all sorts of subterranean civilizations might keep these creatures as guard animals, as, you know, uh, pets, exotic animals used in alchemy and other uh, type of uh, endeavors. Um, and it really, to me, it, uh, suggests a world in which there are as many types of basilisks as there are dogs and cats in our own world. <laughs> the other thing about the baseline description that I think is really cool is the fact that because they eat the petrified victims because they're so slow uh, and don't have the, the means to catch up with them otherwise, that they are able to transmute the stone back into flesh somehow. And that presents a, a, a really elegant solution to a monster that, that usually is fought by low level parties and like petrification can really just stop a party dead in its tracks uh, if it's not able to deal with the petrified party member. I've personally witnessed this several times and you know every time it's like okay well, what do we do? Half the party's petrified and we don't quite know how to deal with this yet. We don't have the spell slots or the level or the money uh, to get our friends back. Our, our, you know, The actual players don't necessarily want to make new characters. Basilis says listen cut this thing open use some alchemist supplies or a you know, arcana check or whatever, really. Uh, it, it's very open-ended how you would handle it and create some sort of oil or, or paste or something that will unpetrify uh, those victims. And I, I think that's really cool because it's like, if you survive, then you know how to defeat this monster. And also like, you now know how to take advantage of uh, it, its resources and uh, therefore, you know, learn a little bit more about the adventuring profession. Um, so I think that's pretty cool uh, that they included that. Thinking outside the monster manual though, I really like the idea of basilisks as a type of elemental creature, right? Especially one attuned to earth. If you think of it as like a native of the plane of earth, that they somehow make their way into the uh, prime material plane through deep caves and fissures in the ground, that kind of thing. Then the basilisk is this sort of magical creature that, that can't help itself. Right, like it's attuned to stone, it's attuned to earth. Like, you know, it's not malicious or, or a monster or anything like that. It's just a creature from another place that is happens to have some inimical uh, power to life on the prime material plane. And so if you go around looking at one of these creatures, meeting its magical gaze, then yeah, of course you're going to be turned to stone. You might be turned to some other kind of mineral or something. Um, but they're decidedly elemental uh, creatures and not like reptilian monstrosities that are, you know, sort of mutated uh, beasts or something like that. <clears throat> this is a size comparison because I'm sure we're going to get questions. If it been, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> 52 ounces of cold water. And finally, the type of basilisk that is my favorite, I think, is that kind that is created through alchemy. Right, a lot of the legends say that, you know, uh, on a clear night of a full moon, <laughs> you know, in the hour before an old rooster dies, if it sits on a snake egg, you'll get a basilisk. Like that kind of specificity, that kind of uh, symbolism really resonates with me. And I like the idea of wizards and sorcerers and alchemists and the like in a D&D world just doing all that they can to steal various kinds of eggs from reptiles and birds and mix them in solutions and baths and figuring out which astronomical alignments produce the best kind of basilisk for their best kind of needs. These could be fashionable, right? Teacup toy basilisks that the rich and powerful majorcrats uh, of the majorcratic empire keep as, uh, you know, curios and items and the like with little visors on them so that they don't accidentally uh, turn their servants into stone. Or they could be used as like living machines. You know, maybe the, the fact that they can eat rock and turn it into flesh means that they're used as tunneling machines. And and that, that the dwarves and the like that, you know, how they 
first dig out a tunnel is by sending enormous basilisks of gargantuan size down there because they're the only ones that can deal with purple worms and other things they might find. And then later on, the dwarves come in and smooth everything out and make it look real nice. So the idea that the basilisk is a creature created through magic, that they are not natural, that, that any time you encounter one, it is a deliberate act of someone else to have made this creature that if you look at it the wrong way, you're literally dead. Uh, <laughs> that I think would really opens up a lot of world building possibilities because then it's like, why did you do that? Who's making these creatures? Can we get our hands on one? Uh, and those are really uh, fun play options. And I think it's, um, well, it's really fun when players get their hands on a monster and can do something fun with it for a while before it gets out of hand. <laughs> I mean, the, the, to, to me, the really cool thing about the basilisk is it is just a blank slate of a monster. You know, like the it's got eight legs, it looks kind of like a Komodo dragon with with a <laughs> bone spurs and glowing eyes, but it can look like anything. It can it can be nearly any kind of reptile, that sort of thing. So it's like a, a good template for reskins and the like. And I think that that's probably why I like. Um, basilisks and other sort of basic D&D monsters like trolls, for instance, or uh, whites and mummies. Uh, they're just very simple, basic monsters that you can do a lot with. As we think about like reskinning and modifying something like a basilisk, because you're looking for a magical beast type creature that, that, that has a magical attack, and this is a good template to use. And so like, for me, my first instinct is to create a basilisk that conforms to what Pliny the Elder and Leonardo da Vinci wrote about it, right? A creature that is surrounded by a lethal miasma of toxins, you know, that can breathe alternatively fire or poison, depending on which legends you read, and that has a, a just a, a stare that causes death because of the intense fire in its eyes. Ca uh, causes the viewer to just be shocked and fall over dead, right? There are a lot of monsters from medieval bestiaries that this is their MO. They look so horrifying and appear so unnatural that anyone who sees them, any right-thinking, good, <laughs> upstanding medieval person would just keel over dead because this is a monster uh, and has some sort of innate quality about it that causes this uh, this death. Um, and so I would start there adding extra features onto a basilisk, maybe calling it something like a greater basilisk or something like that. Legendary basilisk is certain, uh, certainly uh, appropriate for this kind of thing. And really lean into those uh, legends and the ambiguity of them. Like, what is it? That, that happens whenever you look at one of these creatures and, and uh, you know, suffer this fate. How is it that this thing exists and, and what caused it? Is it something that the gods sent down on the world and, and to, as punishment, to, something like that? So that's really where, I, where my first thoughts are. And I think you could really have an, an interesting encounter with something that looks very similar, right? Like players are gonna see eight legs, glowing eyes, stone statues on the way here probably a basilisk, right? But when it breathes out a cloud of poison vapor and they can't really get anywhere near it without also having to suffer that, uh, then you've got yourself a, a situation where the player's expectations are slightly subverted uh, and you can have a memorable encounter just by changing and tweaking a little bit uh, of the creature. Um, but if you're looking for something bigger, bigger modifications, you're wanting to really explore all of the conceptual nooks and crannies of a monster like the basilisk, really the thing to do is to start thinking about what else can it do whenever it looks at you. And to me, the petrification is really weird. There are a, 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 a tetrarchy, a triad, not a triad, a quadrad of uh, stone turning monsters in D&D. Cockatrice, Basilisk, Gorgon, Medusa. And to me, like, I, I can see Medusa, I understand that. Gorgon gets renamed for whatever reason. Um, I understand the stone there. I understand the petrification there. But the basilisk is weird 
because there's nothing about turning to stone in any of the legends. And so it could be that just turning to stone was a nice shorthand for insta-death uh, in older versions of D&D. And then the, as the legacy goes on, it's just like, yeah, they get turned to stone. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? One of the things I love the most about the 5th edition Monster Manual is that they paired the Basilisk right next to the Bahir. And so you have these two monsters in the Monster Manual. Both of them are lizards with multiple legs. Both of them are generally the same color. They're, they seem to be magically created. And my first thought is, yeah, that Bahir is just another type of Basilisk. You know, and like <laughs> the fact that it can spit lightning is just a consequence that it's a different kind of basilisk. And some basilisks shoot, you know, icicles out of their eyes or laser beams. Others of them don't look like they do anything. You just start to bleed and disintegrate and digest before it trundles over to you uh, and begins eating you. I think mechanically there's interesting ways to express this. They could deal elemental damage. They could deal some sort of magical slashing or piercing damage just by gazing. But if you really wanted to go something nasty, it would be like max HP reduction. Like it's not dealing damage. None of your resistances or immunities or whatever uh, can, can do, deal with this. This is just save or have your max hit points reduced. And uh, if you're looking for language for that, the white's life drain uh, is, is where um, you, know, you can find that. And it is a, one of the two ways to <laughs> uh, reduce a, uh, a PC's hit point pool in uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons and bypasses all of those mean and nasty resistances and immunities that those nasty PCs have, right? Oh, geez. Anyway, <laughs> uh, other things to think about with the gaze is like, what type of material is the basilisk turning its victims into? Right? Like there's some, what if there's a reason that this creature can turn its victims into something else other than living matter, right? Like stone is just the beginning. We can think of all sorts of minerals that are useful in alchemy and spell casting and the like, which gives a pretty plausible reason why there might be a lot of mages running around creating these monsters that can turn living creatures into some useful spell casting reagent, right? And you can imagine a wizard on a walk with their basilisk chain, a little visor as they go around trying to kill deer and squirrels and rabbits and things like that and collect the pillars of sulfur or salt or whatever that they leave behind. It was like gemstones or crystals or precious metals. Anything that, that sort of like a mineral, <laughs> you know, of, of the earth, uh, you could easily justify and have different types of basilisks correspond to the things they turn living creatures into, right? I think this really meshes well with the idea of basilisks being a magically created creature, right? It makes sense. Uh, and I'll get to some specific examples of how I've done that in my games here in just a minute, but that's uh, where I start with, uh, you know, with that kind of uh, idea. The other one, and I think this is a, a really big one and can really shake things up, is to start mashing up your basilisk with other monsters. Uh, I already mentioned the Bahir. For me, the Bahir is a type of basilisk that shoots lightning from its eyes, and that's like chain lightning. It leaps from target to target. Uh, it doesn't deal acid damage when it swallows you. Its insides are charged with electricity, right? Like this is an elemental creature that's been pulled from somewhere else or created to serve as this kind of, of, of battery, as it were. Uh, in my campaign worlds, uh, those sorts of creatures are created when a cockatrice uh, sits on a blue dragon egg and hatches it. Uh, that's how you get up here. But um, <laughs> that uh, is, is one way that I've used uh, uh, beholders, or sorry, not beholders, but um, basilisks and behir. Although a beholder of basilisk sounds terrifying uh, as well. If you've got a basilisk that has a bunch of eye stalks on its back, they can look in any direction that it wants. You know, one of them's awake while the rest of them are, you know, catnapping, as it were. It'd be a pretty terrifying monster as well. Um, I like the Hydra basilisk. Uh, I like the idea of a gigantic dinosaur-sized basilisk that has multiple heads and multiple ways of delivering its gaze attack as it sort of like bursts out of some cave or, or swampy undergrowth 
and uh, just everything starts turning to stone, right? Like if I was going to do a Hydra Basilisk, they would be legendary. Any living thing, plants, vegetation, you know, any vegetation, bugs, it's all being turned to stone by this terrifying monster that's like, you know, it's going to regrow its heads as you uh, chop them off and you've got to kill it before uh, everything around you just turns to dust and rock. You know? And finally, I think a good way to uh, modify and change up the basilisk is to consider changing up its size, right? There's a big difference between a tiny basilisk that can turn you to stone with its gaze and a medium or large sized basilisk that can do that. Tiny basilisk could easily be hiding somewhere under the sand and foliage inside of a box. Uh, and all of a sudden you're staring face to face with those magical eyes and finding yourself just feeling slow, tired. It'd be really good to take a long nap. And next thing you know, you're just a big pillar of stone. And who knows what it's like uh, for you when that happens, whether you're conscious, whether you're not, whether it's just like being asleep. Uh, I think it could be very interesting to explore, um, you know, what that means from a player perspective, but I don't know, that's a bit of a tangent <laughs> from where I started. <laughs> I really do like the idea of the of the I, I turn uh, creatures into like amethyst and topaz and you know like the the church has a basilisk that turns things to diamonds so that that's how they get their diamonds for resurrection uh, spells that's um that's what I like uh, like about the idea. Yeah. My favorite use of the Basilisk was in a Labyrinth Lord game that I set uh, within a mega dungeon called Black Rock Mountain. And I didn't do too much detailing of the environment outside of the mega dungeon, really just had a list of features that the party might see on their way to and from settlement to dungeon. And one of those features was a petrified human warrior. You know, chainmail, shield, mace, in the middle of some sort of action, uh, clearly a, a victim of some monster attack of the light. So one of the players, just out of nowhere, uh, months into the campaign, is like, I want to free that person. I don't know who they are, what their deal is, what's going on, but like, they, we can't just keep passing by this petrified person on the side of the road and just leave them there, even though clearly that's what's been happening for decades. And so I'm like, all right, that sounds like a fun quest. Uh, talk to the local druid, figure out exactly how to get a potion of uh, stone to flesh, how to get it uh, into the, uh, <laughs> the victim's care. And my thought was, let's make an adventure out of this. Not just something that you go to town and buy, but something that you have to do, uh, something that you have to accomplish. And so the druid advises, why don't you go hunt some basilisks down in this rocky gulch? You know, there's a lot of trees, a lot of cover, things like that. You kill one of them, I'll show you how to turn its heart's blood into a potion that will remove the petrification. And while the details are a little fuzzy, this was a campaign that took place many years ago, I recall that particular encounter being uh, one which I was very impressed with the players. They were all somewhere between second and third level. Uh, Basilisk is a pretty fierce creature uh, in Labyrinth Lord at that level. And like the way that they used cover of, of observing its shadow to see where it was, of, of luring it someplace with food and then attacking it from behind. There was just a lot of dynamism there and a lot of player ingenuity as they tried to figure out how to overcome this formidable beast uh, and accomplish their goals. And it's really cool. <laughs> I recall it uh, being a success. No one else was petrified. They were able to distill the potion and free that particular uh, victim of petrification, who turned out, I think, to be an evil cleric. Uh, and so <laughs> the party had to deal with the ramifications of that and the fact that this NPC was grateful to them for what they had done and felt a degree of, um, you know, gratitude and, and like, yeah, yes, I, I would be willing to help you as well for some time. Um, and really that's uh, where I remember it ending off. But to me, it is iconic. It's classic, uh, is memorable. And it really is one of my favorite uses of the basilisk. A, a basilisk hunt to free a petrified victim is classic D&D. &D, uh, and every party deserves to have that experience.
<laughs> the other kinds of basilisks uh, that I use are uh, teacup pet basilisks uh, for the various uh, aristocratic mages that live in the street of uh, spells and its uh, various neighborhoods. And for the most part, these are monsters that are created to assist in alchemy and spell reagents, like I mentioned earlier, but that they are also, uh, you know, they're colorful and come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, used as familiars and things like that. And I just like the idea of, of the elite of this uh, fantasy city choosing such a deadly and, and uh, monstrous creature as their uh, pet that they keep in a purse or inside their robe somewhere. You know, that, that they uh, might just have it out with his little hood on like you would uh, leave a hood on a hawk or something like that. And like it, it, the idea that you would have basilisk with like brilliantly colored scales or, you know, mix of feathers and scales that they would be, uh, you know, the equivalent of a teacup poodle uh, or a teacup chihuahua or something like that. Uh, I really like that idea. I think it plays up the magical nature of that setting uh, while also being sort of quirky and weird and presenting a monster in a different light. Uh, they're still as deadly as a uh, regular sized basilisk. They're just, you know, they fit in the size of your hand. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also use another kind of basilisk in that setting, which is a pure elemental creature. Um, they're from the earth, right? They're from earth, uh, the plane of earth. And when they emerge into the prime material plane, they are monstrously huge, like the size of a stegosaurus, right? But every time they turn a creature to stone, they become a little smaller. They erode a bit, right? And the smaller they get, the less potent their petrification. So that by the time they get to be like lizard size, you know, I, you know, you might get slowed by one as long as it continues to look at you and you meet its gaze, but otherwise, the only thing you might notice is that you trip up a little bit if it looks at you. You know, that's just a small little wee creature that has to turn crickets and ants to stone in order to get itself fed, and is more of a curiosity. But it's because it has this limited amount of earth magic in it that it can use, and every time it hunts, every time it goes to eat something or, or defends itself with this feature, it diminishes itself just a little bit. Uh, and so basilisks on the prime material plane are, are sort of lost souls. Uh, and a way to treat one is to show it show its way back to the plane of earth where it can eat all of the minerals and the like that it wants to its heart's content. Um, or you could kill it and take that heart and sell it because it's an enormous gemstone you can use for a variety of magical purposes. Uh, <laughs> And um, finally, I, uh, Basilisk that I came up with during our live stream uh, where I was creating the Wildmire Marches uh, sandbox uh, is named Ferranulon, <laughs> the festering trundler. And um, one of the things I like about when I think about basilisks and how to reskin them is considering different types of lizards to base them on. This one's definitely inspired by the Gila monster, just a big squatty thing that when it looks at you, it doesn't turn you to stone, it doesn't do anything, you just start to bleed everywhere. Your skin begins to fall off as it is lacerated uh, by magical energy from this thing. It's got no teeth. How else is it gonna eat you by the time you get to it? It just hopes that enough of your muscles and flesh have fallen off by the time it gets to you that there's a meal worth having and you won't fight back. Uh, and so that is this uh, terror of the uh, the highlands that uh, are in the Wildmire Marshes. And uh, one day I'll get to use it and uh, see how players react to something that just causes them to start dying <laughs> whenever it looks at them. Um, I think it's really fun to explore the different conceptual possibilities of a simple creature like the basilisk because it's reskinning simple creatures like this that helps keep a campaign fresh it helps keep a dm sane <laughs> as you are exercising your imagination and using monsters that you know really well so you can run them well you can present an interesting encounter but you presented that specific monster in a different way so that your campaign world, uh, the idea in it expands, the expression of it expands, and your players encounter something. It's just a little different than the last time they ran into a petrifying reptilian monstrosity. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. See you next week.
to <laughs> caused death at a glance. <laughs> this is one that I wrote down. Uh, apparently, the hearing a rooster crow will kill a basilisk. If it just hears a rooster. And so, well, that's what travelers in Cantabria in that part of Spain would do because there's a particular type of basilisk, uh, basilisk in Cantabria that's a um, well known. So travelers would carry roosters with them in order to ward off basilisk because if they hear the crowing of a rooster, they keel over dead. Just like if a weasel pees on them, that's how they die as well. But kills the weasel too. So, you know, it's. Shame for that. It doesn't but take much to kill a weasel. It doesn't take much to kill a weasel, but, you know, the odor of a weasel, of a, of a musculin will, uh, will kill a basilisk. So, yeah, I, they're talking about cobras. Like, they're clearly cobras, I don't know, spitting cobra. You look at it, it's going to spit in your eye. That seems pretty deadly. You know, it's a venomous snake. Uh, king cobras can slither upright. You know, they can meet you at eye level <laughs> as a giant snake. And they're hooded meaning that they're also crowned. Because one of the things I really like about uh, pictures of basilisk is how they look like a turtle with a rooster's head. And that that's supposed to be terrifying to the medieval mindset. Um, and I kind of find it more terrifying sometimes than the spike-covered, eight-limbed basilisk of fantasy art. Because it's like, it's a turtle with a rooster's head. Why? Why? Anyway. 